Hi, everybody. I'm Stuart Schlossman. I'm president and founder of MS Views and News, which probably, if you've been on all of our programs so far this year, you're probably pretty much aware of me and, uh, and what I do. And today, we have our Compass to Care, Reaching Rural America, and not included on the slide, it's not just Reaching Rural America anymore. We're, we're also doing a lot on you know, how we reach the underserved communities around the United States. So a lot of that will be included in the series that this is our first of this new series that we're starting. And Dr. Thrower has been honored with the, uh, with doing, we're honored that Dr. Thrower will do this for us. And uh, he's our first presenter for this new series. And um, again, we're sponsored by Genentech for this series right now. Hopefully we'll get more sponsors in the coming months, but this is where we're, where we are beginning. So for today's program, Dr. Thrower is going to be speaking about different things. He's going to talk about multiple sclerosis. He's going to talk about a little bit with having um, um, direct communication with your healthcare team and um, telemedicine. I know he's throwing in a lot about stem cell, and we'll talk a little about COVID-19 and where we are right now, maybe about the vaccines. So before the doctor gets started, I just want to remind everybody who is here or who's never been here before that on the upper right side of your screen, you have a arrow and you have maybe a orange box at the top. And that's where you click on to write your questions. Um, Dr. Throw is going to speak for about 40 minutes and then we're going to come back and we're going to do a Q&A for about 30 or 35 minutes. All right. I do have some questions that we had received in advance. But again, if you have questions for anything that he's talking about, please fill it in online. Okay. And when we're doing Q&A, we'll get to those questions and I'll call them out. All right. So without any further ado, I want to let the doctor get started. Thank you, Dr. Thrower, for being here with us tonight. And let's get underway. Perfect. Thank you very much, Stuart. And uh, thank you to your staff. Thank you to Genentech. Thanks for all our participants for joining in this evening. So let's take a look at, at some of the, the potpourri of what we're going to cover. This is a little bit of, of everything th this evening. So we're going to talk about MS subtypes. We're going to talk about just how do you navigate through different treatment options uh, in MS and the way that, that we as healthcare providers might think about helping you choose. And then, uh, like uh, Stuart said, talk a little bit about uh, COVID uh, and then finish up uh, with a discussion of telemedicine. So traditionally, we've talked about four types of multiple sclerosis. We've talked about relapsing, remitting, secondary progressive MS, primary progressive MS, and progressive relapsing MS. We've actually taken one of these away now. So we've taken away the progressive relapsing category because in all honesty, Nobody really used it. So we'll take a look at this next slide on some of the, we, we take this a step further and we actually divide now secondary progressive MS. So we divide secondary progressive MS into with activity, meaning you either are still having relapses and or new lesions on MRI or without activity, no relapses, no new lesions on, on MRI. This is, it. I would argue that without activity category is the way most of us have traditionally thought about secondary progressive MS, but they are now sort of making this sort of distinction. This is important to, to realize because you will see some of our newer therapies, our disease modifying therapies, approved for secondary progressive MS with activity. And so when they say that, that's what they're talking about. So if we take uh, everyone who's diagnosed with MS at the time of their diagnosis, the lion's share, 85% of people will present with relapsing remitting MS. About 15% are going to probably fall into the more primary progressive category. We argue back and forth, is it, is it really 15%? Could it be 5%, 10%? But we know that the lion's share of people start with relapsing remitting MS. In, you know, we, we, we talk about these boxes and as humans, we like to categorize things. And so we, you know, people with MS want to know, well, which, which box do I fit in? If you take primary progressive MS away, so primary progressive MS is sort of the, the, the if you will, the, the odd man out. It behaves in, in differently from relapsing remitting MS. It's more common in men versus women. It tends to start later in life. And it's categorized by more this kind of slow, continuous progression uh, without a lot of ups and downs. So if we put that one aside, so that one is kind of its own unique little box, and we look at relapsing remitting and secondary progressive, 
they're really not boxes. It's a spectrum over time. And so this is a busy little graphic that shows uh, sort of what, what happens to MS over time without treatment. This is the natural history of MS. So the, uh, everything in the light blue below the, uh, the that dark blue area, these are MRI lesions. So you'll see when the person has their first uh, dark blue bar, their first relapse, this is when they're probably going to come to medical attention. When they come to medical attention, you'll see there have been a lot of little white arrows in that light blue area. These are, re these are MRI lesions that occurred that were largely asymptomatic. So most people at the time of diagnosis will still have, will have evidence of old lesions. We know that in the time we make the diagnosis of MS, that's not really when your MS started. There were studies last year that looked at, at uh, visits to primary care providers that, that people with MS had uh, long before their, their diagnosis was made. And what we saw is a lot, of, a lot more visits in people with MS than in people without MS. And it was for nonspecific things, fatigue, aches and pains, maybe some subtle cognitive changes, maybe mood changes. So clearly there's this prodrome of MS that kind of smolders for a while before we actually make the diagnosis. So now we're into relapsing remitting MS. You see the dark blue bars. These are relapses. Over time, people start accumulating symptoms that don't go away. So this is where that dark blue line is starting to build up, if you will. Eventually, with secondary progressive MS, the relapses will largely stop. New lesions in, on MRI largely stop. And then you're just left with this kind of slow progression of, of symptoms. The challenge that we have is that, that where this is the natural history of MS. We very rarely see the natural history of MS in the real world. We see modified versions of your MS because of treatment. So in a lot of people, we end up stopping the relapses. Maybe we stop the new, new lesions on MRI, but we don't always stop that kind of slow progression. And it's tempting sometimes to use the secondary progressive label in that setting when in fact, maybe that's not appropriate. Maybe you still have relapsing remitting. We're just taking the peaks off of the mountains. And if we took your treatment away, we would start seeing those relapses again. So I think the take home message is, is don't think of these as relapse or think of relapsing remitting and secondary progressive as boxes and realize that on the, the healthcare side of things, we have a healthy degree of humility about using these labels. So, What's in the toolbox from a disease management uh, standpoint? So when I uh, came out of training in, in neurology training in 1992, we had zero FDA approved treatment options. 93, we got beta seron, and then you started seeing our other platform therapies. You know, now we have a pretty long list to choose from. I think there are several important things to know when we look at this box. All of these therapies have a, a certain risk benefit ratio. We can give any of these therapies a grade based upon how effective they are, how convenient they are, how safe they are, and any one of these therapies could be could be right for a given individual. One of the, the things I caution people to, to just be uh, leery of is, is going online with or, or in person support groups and comparing cross therapies. You know, you talk to someone and they're on drug X and I'm on drug Y and you say, well, gosh, maybe I should be on drug X. The therapy that's right for you is right for you as an individual. Uh, and again, we, we can show you people that are doing well on any of these treatments. So what's the goal with any of these treatments? So we would like for you, number one, to tolerate the drug. If, if I put you on a medication and it causes horrible side effects or it's horribly inconvenient, it doesn't matter how effective that medication is, you're probably not going to be very happy with me. So it's got to be tolerable and a good fit for your lifestyle. We would like to prevent relapses. We would like to prevent disability progression and prevent new lesions on MRI. On the next slide, we're going to show you kind of what an, an acronym that you may hear. So there's, a, there's an acronym called NEDA, N-E-D-A, No Evidence of Disease Activity. And so NEDA was was probably a pipe dream, I would say, early on when we when we had our initial therapies, our interferons and our glutamers. Some people did achieve NEDA on those drugs, but but many didn't. Now, as we get into more effective therapies, that really is the goal. We want to you to get an A plus on your MS exam. Some people have used the term NEDA4, so they would add the uh, to the no relapse, no new MRI, 
MRI lesions and no progression of disability, they would add a fourth uh, category, and that would be no atrophy on, on brain MRI. So we've got all of these different treatments to choose from, and we don't have time to go through every one of them tonight, but I, I did want to discuss kind of a paradigm in the way that MS uh, centers think about choosing these, these medications. And really there are two schools of thought in how, how we choose a medication. One is called escalation therapy, and one is called induction therapy. With escalation therapy, you would pick a treatment that has a great safety profile, maybe with modest efficacy. And you would hope that you're going to achieve needle with that drug. But if you don't, you're going to realize that you have things that might be more effective and you're going to move to, to one of those treatments if you see relapses, new lesions on MRI or progression of disability. The counter to escalation therapy is induction therapy. And with this uh, school thought, we said we're going to pick uh, the most effective therapy that we can up front and really have a lot of discussions about uh, managing safety and try to just stay really stay on top of the safety. I would argue that most comprehensive MS centers in the US and Canada have probably moved to induction therapy. So we really think that getting people on the most effective therapy as quickly as possible is probably the way to go. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Probably one of the biggest reasons is that if we're doing the escalation therapy route and we say we're going to move you to a more effective therapy if you have disease breakthrough, well, if that disease breakthrough leaves you with new permanent disability, that's not that's not ideal. The other thing that we know is that there can be a lot of things going on under the surface. And so even though most people with MS get regular MRIs, you know, maybe on a once a year basis, a lot can happen you know, under the surface if you're not on the best therapy for you. So, so again, I think most MS centers have moved to this induction therapy uh, camp. So just let's go back one, one second there before I move on to this. So what would those most effective therapies be? Uh, so I would argue that probably at the top of the food chain would be your, your uh, infusible therapies. So your natalizumab or tisabri, your ocrelizumab, the sister medicine, uh, rituximab, um, uh, lemtrada or alemtuzumab. Um, there's a new medication out, kind of a, 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 a very similar drug to ocrevus uh, called casempta. I would argue that these are probably your most effective therapies. And then you kind of get down into your, your Maven clads and your, your S, S1P drugs, your Jelenia, Mazent, Zaposia drugs. Those, I would say those, those uh, S1P drugs, Jelenia, Mazent, and Zaposia are just probably right underneath the infusible therapies. And then everything else probably clusters underneath that. Um, so when we talk about induction therapy, most MS centers would probably be looking uh, at one of the, at the infusions. So I'm going to go off a, uh, on a little bit of a tangent here because it's, it's a question that people have, and it's I think it's something we're going to see more of in the future. So if we're talking about induction therapy, we're talking about using the most effective treatment that we can right up front. Well, I think you'd have to put autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation up there as probably one of the most effective therapies. Is it ready for prime time yet? No. Could it be in the future? Very, very possibly. So the idea with HSCT is that if you have an immune system that is, 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 has gone awry, it's picking on your myelin and your axons and your central nervous system. What if we just gave you a new immune system? So what if we clean the hard drive um, and rebooted the hard drive with a new immune system? So when we say autologous, we mean that these are cells from, these are your stem cells or your bone marrow cells. Um, that, that's in contrast to allogeneic uh, bone marrow transplants or stem cell transplants. So sometimes people with MS have this treatment for reasons not, not related to their MS. So if you had a certain cancers, leukemias, you might get a bone marrow transplant that is allogeneic. Allogeneic means that you're using a relative or a closely matched unrelated donor. Uh, and it, the end result is the same. You have a new immune system. In the case of, of, of allogeneic, you have someone else's immune system, your brother, your sisters, or a, an unrelated closely matched donor. 
the reason that we don't like doing allergen or thinking about allogeneic stem cell transplants, you know, for, for most people with MS is it's someone else's bone marrow. You will always be in a mild immunosuppressant to prevent graft versus host or host versus graft disease. You don't want to reject that transplant. So let's move on and take a look at some of the steps that, that are involved with this. So what is this in, uh, when we do HSCT or autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplant? What does that look like? So we need, we would like to kick your immature stem cells out of your bone marrow. And so there are uh, things that we can give, uh, granulocyte uh, colony stimulating factor, which basically push immature stem cells out of your bone marrow into your bloodstream, where they can then be, be harvested from a blood draw. So you get a bunch of these immature uh, stem cells, they have the capability of becoming any part of your immune system. So they can become white blood cells, macrophages, um, uh, and then we're going to freeze those cells and set them aside. So then we're going to do something called conditioning. So this is where we're going to wipe out the hard drive. So we're going to give chemotherapy at at very high doses to shut down your, your bone marrow. One of the, the areas of research in, in HSCT is how much chemotherapy should we be giving? So there are two different uh, camps out there. There's one camp that says we should be very aggressive with this and do something called myeloablation. We should wipe the hard drive completely. And there's another camp that says, now nah, maybe we don't wanna be that aggressive. Maybe we can do something called non-myeloablative. And, and there are proponents and studies looking at both of those schools of thought. Obviously, the more of the bad immune system, if you will, you can wipe out, the more likely it is that you have a fresh new immune system that's not going to go down the MS pathway. But that high-dose chemotherapy and the intense immunosuppression do come with risks also. So, so now you, so you've had the chemotherapy, we wiped out your hard drive. Now we're going to give you your immature stem cells back simply into the bloodstream. They're going to establish a new immune system. This usually, you'll start making new immune cells in about three to four weeks. So there is a period of time where you have no immune system. So any little infectious agent that comes along could be a big problem for people. So that's that's where the hedge is at, is you know, during this period of time when you have no immune system, that is when we can see serious complications from HSCT. <clears throat> so there are, the, how does this all work? So we talked about getting uh, a new immune system. There are some people, and I would say that these folks are in the minority, they would argue that the way HSCT works is actually the high dose chemotherapy, that we are so aggressively uh, you know, shutting down your immune system that really the only point of the, the stem cells is just to build it back up again to give you, uh, give you uh, immune protection. I think that group is in the minority. Most people think that the true benefit of HSCT is those new cells. It's the, the new immune cells that have no memory to attack anything uh, in your in your brain or spinal cord. So what have we learned about uh, HSCT? And this is not a, a new uh, procedure. Uh, this has been around for a bit. It can be a very, very effective treatment, but we've also, we need to pick the, the right patient. So how effective is it? So if we think about NIDA, there have been some studies that have looked at what percentage of people achieve NIDA, an A plus on their MS exam after HSCT. It's about 80% at two years and about 67% at five years. If you look at a really effective drug like Tysabri, Tysabri is seven years, you're at about 41% uh, NIDA. So you might argue that HSCT in the right individual could be more effective than some of our really effective uh, therapies. In the United States, this is not FDA approved yet. It is still considered experimental. It's in a weird gray area. There are some centers that will do it outside of trials. The cost is about $120,000 and frequently is not covered by insurance. So when we talk about someone being the right patient, who is the right patient? Ideally, you're going to have aggressive, relapsing, remitting MS. Really what you're looking for is very active inflammation, whether it's aggressive relapses or areas of active inflammation like we see on these two MRIs. Um, 
And ideally, you've been relatively recently diagnosed, probably within the past five years, and you're probably under the age of 50. So this is frustrating for a lot of people. What if I have primary progressive MS or I have secondary progressive MS? The data just does not look as good in those, those individuals. You know, maybe we'll fine tune this procedure in the future, but right now your, your ideal person is, is a yeah, under 50 person with very hot disease. So what about the safety of the procedure? I can remember when I was in Spokane, Washington, and we had our first MS center. Uh, Fred Hutchinson, uh, one of the cancer centers in Seattle, was doing HSCT for people with MS. That's a really good cancer center. Back then, this was in the early 90s, the, the mortality rate was about 5%, so, so not insignificant. In more recent studies, it's very close to zero. So it's still not something to be taken lightly, but at least the death rate has gotten almost uh, down to, to, to zero. Um, there, you know, the, the safety appears to get a little bit less favorable uh, as you've had MS for longer, as disability increases, and as your age increases. So, one of the challenges is there most centers in the United States are being very uh, 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 kind of selective in who they're doing this procedure in, and there are very limited slots. So that leads some people with MS to look at places overseas. Primarily, I would say most of our folks that have looked overseas have gone to Mexico or Russia. What are the advantages of doing that? It's much cheaper. It's about $50,000 out of pocket. Um, and they, I would say these uh, centers abroad or are less selective. They're less picky in who they want to, to, to uh, do the procedure in. That's also one of the disadvantages. That lack of selectivity um, is probably not a good thing. I think it leads some people to be disappointed potentially with the results that they get. We have sometimes kiddingly said that some of these overseas clinics will transplant anyone who has the, the money and a pulse. Uh, they're pretty indiscriminate. The other problem is follow-up. So you go to Mexico or Russia, you have this procedure done, now you're home and you have a complication. You're probably not gonna get on a plane and fly back to that center. So you have to think about what the follow-up is gonna be. Ideally, I think people that do this should have a hematologist lined up back at home to do some of the monitoring as the immune system reconstitutes. So one of the other things I'll just touch on briefly, and that's kind of the, you know, the holy grail of, of MS care. Right now, you could say everything we do in MS, you can put in one of three boxes. We're either treating relapses, we're managing symptoms, or we're keeping you from getting any worse. Hopefully, in the near future, there will be a fourth box, and that's neural repair. How do we actually fix the damage, reverse disability? And I do think we're getting closer. There are a number of different pathways that are being looked at. Mesenchymal stem cells. So these are different from the autologous stem cells. So whenever someone talks to you about stem cells or you read something, try to make the distinction between are we talking about bone marrow transplant stem cells or are we talking about reparative stem cells. Antilingo was a potential remyelinator that unfortunately uh, late last year we had a negative trial. So that one is probably not going any further. The one I'm most excited about right now is elizanumab. So elizanumab, if it does what we hope it does, regenerates axons. It's being looked at in MS and spinal cord injury, it should go into phase three testing. Um, middle part of uh, 2021 would be my best guess, and it already has fast track status through the, the, uh, the FDA. And then an interesting area that, it, that uh, is going on is trying to repurpose known drugs. Uh, so this is a lot of this work has been done at, at UC San Francisco. Taking a, sort of a known medication with a known safety profile, it's already FDA approved, and seeing if just by luck, it might regenerate myelin. So there's a, a, a laboratory assay that was developed called micropillar arrays that's down at the bottom of this slide, where you can put immature uh, oligodendrocytes, the cells that make myelin, into this, this uh, sort of assay with a, a fake nerve fiber. And now, so now you have the cell that could make myelin, you have a nerve fiber for it to grow myelin on. Now you just need something to turn that, that cell on and say, go, make myelin. So they're literally throwing the kitchen sink 
uh, into these assays to see if, if existing medications might uh, generate uh, myelin. There was a hit last year, I've not heard any follow-ups on it, with clemestine, uh, very simple antihistamine, the active ingredient in Tavis, that at least in the this laboratory assay was shown to generate myelin. They then took it to 50 individuals with visual loss from optic neuritis, treated all 50 in an unblinded fashion, and all 50 had some degree of visual recovery. So these are these are things, well, research uh, studies that can move fairly quickly because you don't have to go through the safety part of it. You already know it's safe. It's FDA approved. So uh, just within the past two weeks, there were some uh, some uh, press releases um, from BioNTech. So BioNTech is the company that has partnered with Pfizer to make one of our two COVID vaccines. So so they have uh, they have the vaccine, the messenger RNA vaccine, along with Moderna, who has the other messenger RNA vaccine. Well, they are trying to take that same messenger RNA technology and apply it to multiple sclerosis. Right now, we're at the animal model. So that's the little mouse down at the bottom. So we have the experimental allergic encephalomyelitis model. It appeared to stop MS uh, in the mouse model. So now we need to move into human trials. So this messenger RNA technology could end up being a weird silver lining of all the, the COVID mess that, that we're going through. So just a, a few comments on COVID and, and MS. So in general, people with MS are not at higher risk for getting COVID and they're not at higher risk for getting sicker with COVID. Um, so there's, I think there was an, some initial concern when COVID first started breaking that people with MS and other autoimmune conditions were gonna do very poorly. And fortunately, that's not been the case. There is a large registry in the United States, the COVID MS registry that's tracking everyone they can get their hands on. Uh, with our uh, population, population that we work with here at Shepherd Center. We take care of about 3,000 individuals. We've had about 60 now uh, uh, diagnosed with COVID. Thank goodness, no deaths. We've had two hospitalizations. They recovered uh, completely. We've had a handful of people that were completely asymptomatic. The only reason they knew they had COVID is they had a test for a procedure. So they were going in for, say, a colonoscopy, and they had to have a negative COVID test. And lo and behold, they had COVID. There, the only medication that I would put a little asterisk by uh, are the are our B cell therapies. So Ocrevus, Rituxan, and Kisimta. There is some concern that people on those those therapies could have a higher risk of hospitalization if they get COVID. I think if the if your healthcare team is on top of what we're supposed to be on top of, if we are monitoring your immune function. So these drugs are very specific. They work on B cells in your immune system. We can measure that with a blood test. We want to make sure that these drugs are not affecting your T cells, the other part of the immune system. So if if a person on one of these drugs had low T cell subsets or if they had low antibodies, that may be your group where you're seeing a higher risk of hospitalization. And so again, it's really important that your healthcare team stay on top of these labs if you're on one of these medications. We have a lot of people uh, on these drugs, and I would say we have not had any issues with, with, uh, with a higher risk of COVID or people getting sicker if they did get COVID. Two weeks ago, the National MS Society came out with a guidance statement on the messenger RNA vaccines for people with MS. The challenge that we have is in the studies of the Moderna and Pfizer products, there were no people with MS in those studies. So it's not like I can show you a study and say, here, look, this is how these thousands of people with MS did on the vaccine. So what the National MS Society did is put together a, a, a panel of immunologists and virologists and public health experts and came up with uh, some guidance. And their recommendation was that these vaccines do appear to be safe for people with MS. And in general, we would recommend that people with MS get vaccinated when, when you can. I know the states, depending upon where you, you live, some states are doing a better job than others. Uh, sadly, our state of Georgia, we're 49th out of 50 in terms of rolling out the vaccine. So it, they're coming. Uh, stay in touch with your Department of Public Health uh, to, you know what your resources are. Uh, I believe that uh, incoming President Biden has said he's going to roll out the National Guard and FEMA uh, to set up mobile sites, which should be a tremendous help in, in getting everyone vaccinated. So 
kind of shifting to, to communications, you know, right now, you know, COVID has changed the way we do a lot of things, including sometimes the way you see your healthcare team. So telemedicine, I think, was on the cusp of being a big deal. COVID made it a big deal right now. So everyone had to adopt it very quickly. Um, so, so insurance companies do pay for telehealth visits. Um, in general, the technology is pretty user-friendly. I would say that 98% of our folks who've had telehealth visits have had no difficulty. Typically with most telehealth platforms, you'll get an email from your healthcare provider saying, click on this link at a certain uh, link at a certain time and you'll be ready to go. Obviously, it's not gonna replace everything. If you have a visit that requires an MRI or you're getting an infusion or you have lab work <clears throat> or physical therapy, there are certain things that still need to be hands-on. So treat these telehealth visits just like you would treat a regular visit. Prepare for it. Have your questions and concerns written down and ready. Have your medications, if not written down, at least in front of you so that we, we make sure that what we have in our records matches up with what you, you're actually doing. So treat it just like a regular visit. So there are some other e-developments that we've seen come down the line. So some of you, depending upon what electronic medical record your healthcare team is working with, you may have access to a patient portal. So what patient portals do is they let you go into your medical record for better or worse. So you're going to get to see every note, every lab, every MRI report. I think in general, this is, is a good thing. You will have to have a little bit of a filter up. You know, with some laboratories, you know, for instance, with CBCs, a lot of these CBCs, the results are expressed actually with decimal points after them, which is kind of odd. You say, well, how can you have a fraction of a cell of a white blood cell? That is because they're computer generated. And CBCs have a lot of abnormalities on them. Um, most healthy individuals will have little blips up and down that really don't mean much. So you do have to have a, a bit of a filter up. Many of these patient portals have email uh, capability, so you can communicate with your team securely via email. So be sure, so I would say my chart is one of the more common uh, patient portals that's out there. The other advantage of some of the electronic medical records is you know, we've had a lot of, of E, uh, EMR is available. Now some of the, the smaller ones are kind of being weeded out. And so a lot of hospital systems are now on one called Epic. If most of your healthcare providers are all on Epic, we can see what each other are doing. It, it really is the way that we hoped electronic medical records would evolve to be, that it would, we're not waiting for a piece of paper to get faxed or dropped in the mail to us. We have you know, real-time records. We can see if you were hospitalized. We can see your MRI reports maybe from another facility. So be sure and check with your team and see if, if there is a patient portal capability uh, available to you. And with that, I am going to stop talking and throw it open back open to Stuart and questions and see what you guys want to talk about. Hey, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thrower. Everybody give him a round of applause. Awesome talk. Awesome talk. All right. We do. It is. It's hard to hear those claps, but if you imagine it, they'll be there. I heard okay. it. I heard it. I felt Great. it. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. All right. So we have, um, you know, I'm going to save the COVID questions for last because I'm sure that others might have uh, questions there as well, but I'm going to hit on the ones first that that definitely were not COVID. All right. So Myrna, I'm going to say first names, everybody. I mean, your first name is Myrna in this case, but there's a lot of Myrnas out there and we're not saying the last name. So, you know, um, I'm sure we could just figure it out. No, we're not going to figure it out. All right. Myrna wants Myrna wrote, what does it mean when MRIs progressively get worse? For example, Many more lesions spreading throughout the brain and spinal column each year, but the patient presents with an EDSS that improves over time from the onset of the disease. What can you say about that? That, that is a very unusual situation because normally we see the opposite. We see MRIs that are stable and the person says, but I don't feel very stable. I'm getting worse. And it's very frustrating for people right. to have a stable MRI when they feel like they're getting worse. Um, so again, you go back to, so what's an A plus on your MS exam? It, it's no relapse, no progression, no new MRI lesions. That's a really unusual situation to see new lesions forming in the setting of someone getting better. And I, I, that 
I would say that's awesome. Ultimately, we treat humans and not pictures, and so it's great. Would it bother me a little bit that the person's pictures are getting worse? Probably a little bit, and depending upon what therapy they were on, I still might have a discussion about, you know, I'm happy that you're getting better physically, but man, I'd sure like to see your your pictures not get any worse, and maybe you know, could we move you to something that would give you both of those those things. I would say that the only other thing I would factor in is, is you know, MRI technology gets better, and so pictures get more sensitive as time goes on. So sometimes we see what looks like new lesions when, in fact, it's, we're just seeing old lesions better. And so if you go, from, for instance, from a 1.5 Tesla MRI to a 3 Tesla MRI, sometimes you, you can see old lesions more effectively, and maybe they're really not changing. Right, thank you. So retrospectively, and I actually had a person write it here, and in the pre in the pre qualifying questions, some patients physically worsen without the MRI showing any new lesions. Can you tell us why? Yeah, that that's the more common scenario. So there, I think there are two potential explanations for that. So if you have lesions on brain or spinal cord MRI, you know, think of them as like clouds in the sky. So let's say that you put new lesions behind an old lesion. So now you have a cloud behind the cloud. Sometimes we can't appreciate new stuff because it's buried in with the old stuff. Now, if it's if it's actively inflamed, giving contrast may help us actually see it as a, as a new lesion. But sometimes I think people hit a certain lesion load and they accumulate new stuff and we just really can't appreciate it. I think the more recent sort of explanation, and, and it's I think it really hits home, is something called loss of neural reserve. So imagine your old MS lesions are like tree stumps under the surface of a lake. So you've got your lake level, that's your neural reserve. So you have old lesions that are asymptomatic because they're under the surface of the water. After age 30, all of our brains and spinal cords start shrinking a little bit. It's a harsh reality, but it's human nature. All of our brains start shrinking after age 30. So we start losing neural reserve. Now, so that so what's happening after age 30 is our lake level is dropping. Now that tree stump that wasn't above the surface of the water as the lake level drops, now it's above the surface of the water. So you could be having progression of symptoms, not because your MS has changed, but because you're losing neural reserve. Um, that's a, I think it's a great explanation. It's also a challenging one because the next part of that discussion is what do we do about that? Putting people on a really good anti-inflammatory DMT, a Tysabri or an Ocrevus, probably doesn't stop a loss of neural reserve. So people on those really effective therapies can sometimes still get a little bit worse. That's where that fourth bucket of MS care really comes in is how do we reestablish neural reserve? How do we push the clock backwards? And, and I do think we'll, we will get there. So for those that are showing though, like some of that worsening, and this is not anybody's question, but just something I want to throw in. Um, is there a way to retrain the body as yeah. to that's a great, great point. So, so we sometimes, and I stole this from our physical therapist, our, our physical therapist sometimes use the analogy of, of a bucket of disability. And you think, okay, what's in the bucket? Well, some of the, the, there are really two ingredients in the bucket. One of the ingredients is damage in the brain and spinal cord. You know, we want to prevent that ingredient from getting any bigger. We want to get towards neural repair and, and make that ingredient smaller. But the other ingredient is deconditioning. None of us exercise probably to the degree that we should. Maybe some people do, but most of us could do better. And people with MS decondition much more quickly than people without MS. So reconditioning through wellness programs, through physical therapy, occupational therapy, does make that deconditioning component of your bucket of disability smaller and will technically reduce disability and improve function just through being in, in better shape. Okay, thank you for that. All right, Debbie wants to know, does Dr. Throw recommend taking a MS patient off their meds when they, if they've been doing extremely well and they reach the age of 65? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And, and the, the answer is maybe. Um, so what she's talking about is a concept called immune senescence. So our immune systems mellow out as we get older. So it's less likely that a 65 year old is gonna have active inflammation than say a 25 year old. So there is a point where 
people with MS can probably come off of their DMTs. The challenge is we don't have a blood test that lets us tell us when that point is. So I would argue there's not a strict age. There are 75 year olds out there whose whose immune systems still think they're 25. Um, so it's a it's a discussion between the healthcare team and the individual. If the person's been stable, stable for many years and their MRIs have been stable, maybe the the uh, the drug is getting to be a hassle to take, or maybe there's a financial hardship. So those are all the things that factor in. What we don't want to see is someone making you do that. So I, I we don't want to see a third party entity, you know, uh, insurance company, a government entity coming in and randomly picking an age and saying, okay, at this age, everyone's off treatment. It's what they do in the UK. Uh, so they pick an age in the UK and then they really lean on people hard to come off of their treatments. And, and it's largely for financial reasons. OK, thank you. Um, by the way, everybody, please know that if you have any questions that are relating to COVID, it's not that I'm skipping over them. Well, I am just so you know, I am going to skip over them. I'm going to skip over them until we get past all the other questions and then we're going to hit on everything to do with MS questions. So if it has anything, if you put in the word COVID, it's going to wait. <laughs> All right. That's just the way it is. All right. So, um, all right. Next one. Uh, Elizabeth is asking what specific labs should be done for B cell therapies. So, so a complete blood count, um, liver function studies, T and B cell subsets. So, so we want to make sure that you're, so when we measure your B cells, we can check either the CD19 or the CD20. So technically you're on a CD20 therapy, but the CD19 receptor always travels with the CD20 and the CD19 test is more readily available. So typically when we're talking about what your B cells are doing, we're talking about what your CD19 cells are doing. We want to look at your T cells because we don't want those to drop. And then I would argue that we need to look at your antibody levels, um, at least IgG. Some people would say IgG and IgM. Uh, so between those, so, so ideally what we'd like to see in someone on a B cell therapy is that your total lymphocyte count is normal. Your CD19 is zero or close to it. Your T cell subsets are normal and your antibody levels are normal. Okay, thank you. All right, next we have Cindy asking, can you explain the difference between getting AHSCT and or simply taking Lemtrada? So good question. So Lemtrada, you could argue is kind of like a little miniature AHSCT. So it is, Lemtrada is, is an anti-CD52 monoclonal antibody. CD52 receptors are on B cells and T cells. So what you're doing is you're knocking out big populations of both B cells and T cells, and then they're coming back in a less angry state. Um, one of the challenges with Lemtrada is the B cells sometimes at about six months come back with a little bit of a vengeance. So they come back actually in a sort of an agitated state, if you will. So you can see B cell driven autoimmune diseases uh, on rare occasions in people on Lemtrada. But the idea is sort of similar between Lemtrada and AHSCT. I would argue that hematopoietic stem cell transplant is just probably magnitudes more um, uh, not necessarily aggressive, but you're really cleaning the hard drive. Whereas with a uh, Lemtrada, you're kind of par partially cleaning the hard drive. Thank you. Next, what are the biggest challenges patients from rural communities face with regard to diagnosis and treatment? Yeah, so I think, you know, everyone with MS deserves a comprehensive integrated team. Ideally, you'd be able to go to one facility and everything's under that one roof. Sometimes that's not possible. And the further from, you know, from major metropolitan areas you get, sometimes the more challenging it is. That doesn't mean you can't have comprehensive care. You just sometimes have to put the pieces of the puzzle together. So you might have to know who is the best physical therapist, who's the best you know, speech language pathologist for you to put your comprehensive team together. Um, there, there's still a lag from symptom onset to diagnosis. You know, we said earlier how MS clearly starts way before we diagnose it. So if you're in a, a rural community where maybe there's not as much familiarity with, with MS, it could potentially lead to, uh, to a, a slower diagnosis. Not always. Though. I've, I mean, there are wonderful doctors out in the, the rural communities. You know, I think of, of a doctor, Dr. Chris Legank in northern northern uh, Alabama. You know, he's in a he's not in a big area, but he has a 
probably one of the better MS centers around and a tremendous amount of experience uh, you know, and very dedicated to the, the uh, MS community. So, yeah, the, I think being in an outline area does present more challenges. When I was in Spokane, Washington, one of the challenges that we had was weather. So we didn't schedule appointments for some of our patients from North Idaho between October and about April because they lived in really back in the sticks in the mountains and they were snowed in for most of the winter. So you get into different parts of the country, you have different challenges with getting in. We had no telehealth back then. It would have been wonderful for those, those individuals. Great. That's another question for later. But first, I'm going to get to something else with rural America still. All right. So for those that are quite disabled and living in rural America, I mean, really remote rural, I'll probably have to say, and they have low incomes and they're in an underserved total of everything in their area. They um, but they have problems with physical activity, strengthening. They don't have any of those programs by them either. There's no support groups, no specialists in the area. What do you think? Should they pick up and move to a larger area? <laughs> I mean, that, that that's a really personal decision. I think if someone's walked through That's not my that question. People, that's something that somebody asked. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's... Would you get better health care? Probably. And so I have some family experience with that. When my in-laws retired <clears throat> from Jupiter, Florida, they moved up to the panhandle of Florida uh, into a little town called Baker, Florida. A cool little town absolutely no healthcare services whatsoever. So of course, then they both develop all kinds of health issues. They were constantly traveling to Pensacola, Mobile, Atlanta for all their health care, And it probably would have been just easier for them to live in, in one of those areas. Um, some of the things that, that you mentioned, we could take care of remotely. So for instance, with wellness programs, there's a lot of online uh, exercise program pro programming out there. So if people are not familiar with Can Do MS, look up Can Do MS, great group of people. Uh, they're, they're just starting a program right now in January, looking at uh, sort of uh, remote exercise, stress management, uh, nutrition, so many different wellness issues, and it's all free and it's all online. There is a big interest in tele rehab. So one of the largest grants that we've ever been given here at Shepherd Center was from a group called PCORI, Patient Centered Outcome Research Initiative. And what what we heard from a group of people with MS is they wanted remote exercise options. So the study is taking uh, two groups of people. One comes here for traditional exercise and rehabilitation. The other group is doing all the rehabilitation remotely. And most of those remote folks are in outlying areas. Great, thank you. And just so you know, MS Views and News twice a month has a physical therapy program. And oh, that's, awesome. moving, that's moving with Gretchen and um, and we do that twice a month. She's on there. Each month the topic changes, but it's like the beginning of the month she teaches about something and the latter part of the month it's a review of that whatever took place at the beginning of the month. So this does change and this is going to be going on until I think the end of this year. So um, it's something that everybody should look at. Also, we have a new wellness program that will soon begin with emotional wellness. Jessica Thomas will be doing this. Awesome. And um, she was just a guest of ours last week on another program. But going forward, she's going to be having these conversations with people online about what they need to do for to relate and get themselves back on track with wellness. But enough of that. Now let's go back to your questions. All right. I get sidetracked so easily. All right. Um, <laughs> What do you think about telehealth? Is it going to continue post COVID? Uh, absolutely. I don't think there's any question it'll stick around. I think what we're finding is for certain people, for certain visits, it's a real convenience. So if I have someone in a power wheelchair who lives three hours away and I really just need to touch bases with them, I'm not drawing labs or doing an MRI, I can save them all that transportation and get them down here. It's actually, I think insurance companies are liking it because sometimes it's cheaper. You know, some facilities uh, where you have hospital-based MS centers, um, there's a facility fee. So every time you set foot inside that building, whether for, for a lab or an MRI, there's a certain facility fee that's generated to your insurance companies. Well, you get rid of that with, with a telehealth visit. I, I don't think it's going away. Okay. So the only reason why I brought that up is because I've heard inklings from others that um, post-COVID, though, that the insurance industry might tighten it up to where you can have a telemed appointment with a doctor for only within your state. 
Yeah, I've heard some of that as well. I think that would be really unfortunate. And hopefully right. lobbyists will push back on that because it just, it makes no sense. And I think if the insurance companies really step back and said, what's in the best interest of the patient? You know, there are not a lot of times when sometimes what's good for the insurance company really lines up with what's good for the patient. I think this is one where they do. If, the, if they really looked at it, it's going to save them them money and be good for certain patients as well. True. Sure. All right, next one is uh, broadband access not available for everybody. What do you feel about the barriers for broad broadband legislation? Oh, that's, I, I will confess, I, I, I don't know much about the politics of that. We have had a handful of people <clears throat> that we could not do telehealth with because their, their broadband was just not up to, to par. And so what we ended up doing was just a simple telephone visit. Um, not ideal. I don't think you get the same sense of what's going on without physically seeing someone, I think you lose a sense of connectedness between the two people. So I, I, I'm not aware of where the legislation is, is heading. So I, I, I don't know about legislation either, but I did hear that the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation does have some kind of grant program to provide some kind of broadband service to people in remote areas. Again, I don't know the specifics about it. We just did have Natalie Blake online with us last month. She did awesome. speak about it. So if anybody wants to know about it, you could just visit our YouTube channel and find the uh, interview that I did with Natalie and Derek and um, from the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. And she does talk about that. And I would urge people too, if, if you're being seen at a comprehensive MS center, ask about different grants and funding mechanisms. So you have grants like uh, like you were saying, Stuart, through the MS Foundation. Sometimes the the centers themselves have little pots of money and grants. So, so I know we do here. So we have you know grants that could be used for things that are a little bit outside the box, like joining a health club or getting broadband. All right, thank you. Is there anything that you know of that can be done, said, or otherwise to doctors in the smaller areas that, um, only allow like 10 or 15 minutes for a patient when they actually have more serious problems and can't even get in to see that doctor maybe once yeah. a year and they're not given the time? How do you, how do you, how do we um, speak to these people about creating more awareness to that gap in care? So I think if you're clearly you can't do what needs to be done for an individual with MS in a 10 to 15 minute follow up. So we have 30 minute follow ups here and even that is pushing it sometimes. Um, you can request when you make your appointment to have you know, a, a larger slot, uh, some, some will and some won't. But you know, if you are you know, doing a say a 30 minute block of time, your doctor can bill for that. So a lot of our billing is based upon time codes. And so it's, it, it, you know, it's not like they're losing money to do that longer block of time. Sometimes it's just a matter of asking that scheduling person up front, hey, can, can I be put in for a, a bigger block of time? Um, you know, it, it's out in the communities. A lot of times it's about financial survival for the, for the physicians. Uh, like my wife's a pediatrician. I mean, they, they really see patients about every 10 minutes for financial survival, uh, and just move very quickly. But I think with MS, that's, it's, that's a tough thing to do something in 15 minutes. So I would ask for a longer time. Sure. Thank you for that. All right. So everybody, did you hear that? Whoever asked that question, just demand more time. Yep. There you go. All right. Yes. Tell me that you're a good paying customer and you got to get more time. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, Laura would like to know, uh, would like me to ask you about remote speech therapy. Is that a possibility? Yeah, possibly. <clears throat> so I think remote physical therapy and occupational therapy are tough, but I think of all the therapy modalities, speech is probably the one that, that lends itself best to remote therapy. So yes, our uh, speech language pathologists are doing some remote uh, therapy. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, the next one is, um, that's COVID, we have to wait on Facebook. All right, um, oh, so somebody, Robin is saying, I almost said her last name by accident, sorry about that, Robin. Um, and thank you for being here though. On Facebook, there's an eight week MS Fitness Challenge gym that just started. Um, is that with David or is that with, um, um, I forgot the other guy, MS Gym? All right, so one or the other. So there's Dave, Dave Lyons that's got a big program all the time, the MS Fitness Challenge. 
And then there's the MS Gym guy that's out there. So you can look up either one on Facebook and find what Robin might be speaking about. Okay. All right. Awesome. Um, all right. She said, give you a minute, but I think I just answered it. Okay. Next, we have one from the beginning of the session. All right. Um, how does, and I don't know anything about this, how does genome editing factor into an MS cure? So there, obviously there are genetic factors that go into a person having MS. So, so we think MS results from genetics and environment. And so we've identified over 200 genes that play a role in a person's risk for MS. As you get into, you know, DNA vaccines and, and you know, DNA therapies, it's possible that someone could, could come up with something. I think the challenge in, in MS versus say, look at Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So with Duchenne's, you really have one genetic abnormality. And if you could correct that, maybe you you fix the problem. Whereas with MS, you have this multitude of, of genetics all throwing their two cents worth in. Maybe if we could identify one of those genetic risk factors that plays the biggest role, maybe we could then go in and, and modify that, that genomic factor. Great, right, thank you. So we have one, maybe two questions left that are non-COVID, okay? <laughs> and then we're gonna hit up all those COVID questions, all right? All right, so the first one is, can you please discuss the value of rehabilitation for multiple sclerosis? Invaluable. So, so rehabilitation should be, a, I mean, one of the biggest tools in your toolbox. So, so people with MS decondition more quickly, relapses leave people with sometimes lasting challenges that can really be amenable to physical therapy. When you think about some of the walking issues that we see in MS, um, one of my favorite things is when I see a new individual uh, with MS who's maybe been dealing with MS for a while and they've never seen a physical or occupational therapist. That's just a blank slate. I know when that, we send that person down for PT and OT, maybe speech language pathology, that there's just going to be a wealth of, of things that can be done to help that individual. So, so really, you know, PT, OT, uh, speech language pathology are just an, a vital, vital part uh, of, your, of your comprehensive team. Okay, thank you. All right, next we have persons writing. I'm an MS patient. I had my first two doses of Ocrevus in December of 2017. Circumstances and surgeries prevented me from continuing six months later. Can I begin again at any time? And will I need the first two doses, the two weeks apart again? Or can I just begin a six-month schedule? Yeah, I think given the length of time that you've been off Ocrevus, I would recommend probably doing the, the split dose again and, and treating you as if you're brand spanking new, just to be on the safe side. Okay, great for that. And now, guess what? Bada bing, we're here. COVID time. <laughs> Show to COVID time. Yeah, there All we right. go. All right. Um, firstly... Yes, and for the person that asked, why am I not wearing a tie? <laughs> I had it, okay? I had it, I was gonna wear it, but I just felt like not doing it tonight, okay? All right, everybody sees me with my tie, so I always gotta get a comment from the peanut gallery, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, first one, is it safe to get the COVID vaccine? Yes, so the only only little caveat I would put in there is there. Uh, if you're on one of the B cell therapies, just talk to your healthcare team about the timing of that COVID vaccine. So, you know, we're telling individuals if you're if you're starting Ocrevus Casempta or Rituxan, you're not on it yet. We would like to get you vaccinated six weeks prior to starting the drug. If you're already on the medication, we're telling people two weeks before, two weeks after your your Ocrevus or Rituxan dose. The National Medical Society, I think, is saying three months after. So there, there's not a clear right or wrong answer on that. I mean, I would like to get people vaccinated as soon as they can humanly do it. And I, I think two weeks after a dose or two weeks before your dose is, 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 is fine. Right. Thank you. So for everybody that's on here, and if you don't know, all the MS organizations recently put out what the MS Society did with uh, guidelines to the vaccines, okay? And um, you can find it on every one of the MS um, patient advocacy websites. And uh, yes, we have it as well. And there there were links of it in our last newsletter. So if you get our Beacon e-newsletter, you could find it in there too, okay? 
Um, but yeah, that would be a great place to go to get a lot of the information that you might have on questions. Okay, but now we'll take the next one. If the MRA, mRNA meds, Pfizer is being developed for MS, then is MS a virus? No. So what you're, so messenger RNA is just simply a blueprint for a protein. Um, so with the, the COVID vaccines, you have a blueprint for the spike protein. So you're telling your body to make the spike protein to fool your body into thinking you've got COVID, when in fact you don't. You're just making an immune response to COVID. And then every time your body sees that virus, the COVID virus, it's going to make an immune response to it. What they're doing with the, the vaccines for MS is you're maybe trying to tone down the immune over response response by having messenger RNA sort of produce a, a protein that would, would sort of tone down MS over activity. So in some ways, you can see you're kind of vaccinating yourself against MS, but no, MS is, is not a, a virus. It can be, it has been linked to certain viruses. So uh, Epstein-Barr virus, uh, human herpes virus 6 or roseola. These are virus, <coughs> viruses that in the genetically susceptible individual might fool your immune system into going down this MS pathway, but MS itself is not an ongoing viral infection. Okay, thank you. And that was by K. So I missed her name. So I'm saying it now. And there's a lot of K's out there, like I said, but this was by that K. All right, you know who you are. <laughs> All right. Cindy asks, will the newer bio and tech studying the effects of the mRNA technology be studied on humans at your center at any time in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I, special studies for MS. Yeah, we would love to, to be part of it. I mean, we try to participate in every trial that comes along. We tend to jump on research when it's at the phase three level. So phase two trials are a lot of the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, lots and lots of blood draws for the individual. Um, I tend to like for Shepherd Center to sign up for trials where there is a clear benefit for the individual with MS. And I would never sign up for a trial here that I would not put my own family member into. So that I tend to like to jump on board at the phase three level. Um, so, I mean, certainly if we're offered the phase three on, on that, that messenger RNA for, for MS, we would certainly sign up for that. Okay, thank you. We only have four more questions here on COVID. Could you imagine that? All, All right. right. But the next one, um, I know I've asked you this, but I'm going to ask you again because they didn't hear it. And that is, uh, have any of your patients have had one or two vaccine dosages yet? And have they had any um, side effects to it? So, so, yes, we do have individuals with MS who are frontline healthcare workers uh, who have had um, both of their doses of um, the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, I know I have a handful of individuals who've had dose one of Moderna um, and no issues, uh, I would say, outside of the MS community. So, uh, right now at Shepherd Center, we have probably 1,100 of our staff have been vaccinated at this point. Uh, I, I just did dose two of Moderna uh, yesterday. So, you know, we're, we're going to see typical vaccine side effects. You're going to see people have chills and aches and pains, and you're going to see probably rare individuals who have true allergic reactions. Those are vaccine side effects. You know, we're, we're up to, I believe, about 7 million people that have been vaccinated in the United States. So we're going to see the, I think, the routine stuff. Everything's under the microscope right now. So because this is new technology, and unfortunately, because COVID got a little bit politicized uh, on both sides, everyone's really watching these vaccines. And so I think you're going to hear a lot more about any little side effect that pops up. Thank you. So for the person that asked about Ocrevus, and there's been a lot of others that ask about it as well, are they, and I know you mentioned it earlier, but I just want you to hit on it again. Are they safe to get the vaccine and for any of the other immunosuppressants? Yes. Yeah, so any any of the, the disease modifying therapies are safe with the COVID uh, vaccines. The issue with the B cell therapies is not a safety one. It's a, it's a timing issue. Could you be making the vaccine less effective by, by giving it too close to uh, an Ocrevus or a Cosenta or a Rituxan? So it's not so much a safety issue as, as much as it is, are, are we decreasing the effectiveness of, of the vaccine? Okay, thank you. All right. So here's a question. Um, it's hard to stay active due to COVID. Any tips on getting more active? Exercise yeah. doesn't see, exercise does exercise isn't helping. This person says this is from Renee. 
again, there are a lot of Renees out there. So again, take advantage of any of these online exercise programs. And I would say it's really important to get outside some. So you can go outside safely, you know, away from people and get a walk, get some sunshine, because your mental health is just as important as your physical health. And I think a lot of people are suffering from, you know, maybe being a little more isolated, not seeing, you know, friends and family the way that we typically would. So get outside, get some sunshine as much as you can. Take advantage of the online exercise uh, options, some that, that, you know, were mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, yeah. Okay. Next is from Robin. Um, she's not sure if this was asked. Is there any, is one vaccine better than another for the MS community? No. So looking at the, the efficacy and safety data with the two, the, the Pfizer and the Moderna, they're really, really close. Um, so I, I would take whichever one you have access to. Okay. How does AstraZeneca fit into this? So the AstraZeneca and then the Johnson & Johnson, these are more typical you know, viral based. Um, I believe they're both using adenovirus as a vector. So it's a little bit more of a traditional uh, vaccine. I believe they're both going to be um, uh, attenuated dead virus. So th we've not seen the safety data yet on those, but I would anticipate they'll b both be safe for, uh, for, for MS as well. Well, you said both, but I missed who else you were saying in addition so, to. Uh, so you've got Johnson and Johnson also. Right. I think Johnson and Johnson's will probably come out before the AstraZeneca uh, product does, but who, who knows? I okay. think the one of the appeal appeals to the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is it's a it's a one dose versus right. Pfizer and Moderna, which are two shots. Right. I thought I heard somebody tell me that Johnson and Johnson was using a live virus. Is that not true? I don't know that for sure. I know it's an adeno, um, but yeah, if, if it does turn out to be, I thought it was attenuated, um, but if, if it does turn out to be live, we'll have to readdress that. that. That would not be ideal. Right. Okay. That's what I figured. And AstraZeneca, as far as I know, was approved in the uh, European countries. So Correct. we don't know how long it'll be till it gets back here to the States. Yeah. Okay. All right, we got some more questions coming in. How about that? Um, yeah, exactly. Um, Linda writes, should MRIs in stable patients be put off until after COVID is more controlled? If so, how long should an MRI be delayed? And is going in the MRI machine dangerous for getting COVID? So most MRI facilities, most MS clinics, most hospitals are being really, really cautious and really proactive. So they're doing telephone screening for the for the individuals, the staff, you know, in the, whether it's MRI or infusion suite, um, we're being very proactive. So for us, for instance, we get temperature screens before we come in. If we have any hint of, of not feeling well, uh, we have on-site uh, COVID testing, the, the rapid testing. Most MRI facilities, I think, can get you in and out safely. Um, they're really trying to, if you, and I, I think it's fair to ask them, you know, wherever you get your MRIs, ask them what their COVID policy is. Are you gonna be the only person in the waiting room at the time? Uh, I know for us, that's the case. We only have one person in the waiting room. Uh, so there's nobody else in there, they're with you. Um, we can probably push MRIs back in some people. So it's going to be very individual. So if you've been stable over 10 years with your annual MRIs, I don't see any, any big problem with maybe skipping a year. Um, I think it's hard to give a really, you know, uh, you know, black and white answer because it's, there are so many variables for each individual. But yes, MRIs can be skipped. Yes, you can get in safely to most MRI facilities, but I would ask questions about what their, what procedures are they masking? Get yourself a good mask. Don't don't rely on everyone else to, to do the right thing. If you, if you have access to a KN95 mask or an N95 mask, there's also the KN94 mask. So these are masks that are, that are a notch above. You're, you're just your, your usual cloth mask. So they're going to, you know, cloth mask, I think I, I kind of refer to as courtesy mask. If everyone has a cloth mask on, then we're all protecting each other. All it takes is one person not wearing it, though, and then it kind of breaks the chain down. So if you wear a mask that protects you, regardless of what people are doing around you, I think that's ideal. What about the people that are wearing cloth masks with filters? I jokingly call those screw you masks. Or the, the, you're talking about the one-way filter or the... So the mask... No, no, no. The not, the, not, the one, not the one with the uh, with the hole in the center that you're breathing out all over yeah, everybody. Yeah, that's yeah, the we, screw we, you we mask. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, but what about the ones that had used in the true, um, like a mask where they had, yeah. they made, they either made it themselves or somebody made it for them and it has a sleeve insert inside to put one of your filters. So there, you can look up studies on, you know, how effective different filters are, you know, terry cloth versus flannel versus, so those, those studies are out there. I think some of those are really good. Uh, ideally yeah. they'd be getting washed periodically. I would say, you know, probably your, your cloth mask, basic surgical mask is probably your, your basic next notch up would be your a cloth with a really good filter and then you get into KN95 and then N95. Sure. sure. So I was telling you earlier that, um, you know, I, I travel this distance all the time and, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm around people basically that I know, I'll wear just a fabric mask. And um, when I'm going in and out of a supermarket or in and out of a rest area or whatever, poof, on goes on the KN95. Yeah, I want to make sure yeah. I'm protected. And I also have my goggles that I wear in many places, too. So. And I think that's smart. If you're in an area with a lot of people, you know, public transportation, so, you know, crowd, I would think about eye protection as well. Sir, I can do, I can do one more. I'm going to have to boogie here in just a second. So, so give us your very best one question. Very best. Oh my God. And I got to go through a whole <laughs> bunch of them. Hold on a minute. Um, uh, da, 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 da. I don't know what to say here. You're putting me under the gun here. I know. Um, okay. Two more. Okay. Is it, right. is it, is it safe uh, for somebody to be on steroids to take the vaccine? Um, it's safe. Uh, so there's no contraindication. So um, there is, you know, a question of whether, anti-inflammatory medicines, even Tylenol and ibuprofen and Aleve, could they make the vaccine a little bit less effective? Um, I'm, I think I'm kind of a purist. I, I think when you do your vaccine, I would not pre-medicate with Tylenol, Aleve, or ibuprofen. Um, if you're miserable with side effects afterwards, which you shouldn't be, but if, you, if you're really achy, I think taking a little bit of Tylenol, Aleve, or ibuprofen after your vaccine is fine, but I would try to avoid doing it beforehand. Um, I think it's safe to do steroids in the vaccine. I, I would worry a little bit. Could we be decreasing the effectiveness of it a, a bit? Okay. One last one that we rarely hear, and I get hit up with this question all the time. How many times is it safe to wear a KN95 or an N95? So we, if you were wearing an, uh, a KN95 or an N95 on a daily basis, um, I would I change mine out every two weeks. Uh, some policies say every four weeks. Just make sure you store it in a dry place. Uh, you know, ideally like the, the uh, brown paper bag, let it really dry out uh, well. You know, if you had two masks and rotated them, I think that's going to give you the, a, a little bit you know, cleaner environment. But um, I, I would, to be on the safe side, I would probably change them out every two weeks. So can can KN95s be washed? I never heard of that. No, no. So they're just, a, I mean, this is a KN95 you know, here. Um, and they come in. So this is another KN95 uh, here. I mean, there, it's a, it's got good filters in it. But if you put it in a washing machine, it, it's going to turn into pulp. Yeah, exactly. I have tons of them, tons of them, tons of them. And then, of course, you know, I have my personal one. So I got to wear this too at times. There you go. Be happy with it. There we go. All right. So that being said, and Dr. Thrower needs to go. So we're going to wrap things up and we're just going to say thank you, Dr. Thrower, for being on here with us. And I want to thank everybody that was part of this program tonight. We cannot do these programs without you. So thank you for being here. I hope you like the background. I hope you like I didn't wear a tie and um, and too bad I didn't wear a tie. OK. And uh, <laughs> and I'm hearing from several. They want to thank us both for doing this. So, again, thank you, Dr. Thrower. I can't wait. You're going to be back on with us in a couple of months. I can't wait to have you for that topic either. And uh, let's go with it. Go have a great awesome. night. Everybody be well. Stay safe. Wash your hands and wear the damn mask, okay? Good. Take care, Take care. everybody. Bye-bye.